Okay, so we'll uh, we'll continue on here. So these are maybe maybe I'll uh, I'll star this this step. This is kind of our decision criteria here. Okay. Um, all right. Let's um, well let's talk about the implications of choosing a large or small alpha. I know. This is not really a huge issue uh, a lot of the time because we kind of default to using alpha equal to 5%. But there are arguments for you know whether you should use a larger alpha or smaller alpha. And it really comes down to um, how often you are willing to be wrong and, how, um, and what kind of mistake is worse, OK? And so in hypothesis testing, there are two types of mistakes that are inherent to hypothesis testing. These are, these are not mistakes that happen because you made a calculation error or something. But these are mistakes inherent to the idea of making conclusions from limited data. Okay? Because you do not have all of the data, you will not make perfect decisions every single time. Okay? And so there are two types of mistakes that can happen. And um, we have decided to name them type 1 error and type 2 error. So type 1 error is we mistakenly reject the null hypothesis. OK? So this means the null hypothesis is actually true, but for whatever reason, our data leads us to conclude that we should reject the null hypothesis. On the other hand, we have the type 2 error. Okay? And so this is we uh, mistakenly do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay? And so this means the null hypothesis is actually false. Okay? But Either we don't have enough data, or our data, mis quote, misleads us, OK? So but um, we either do not have enough data, or you know our data just misleads us. I'll just say leads us not to reject the null hypothesis. All right. So you have done all of the steps correctly, but you either don't have enough data or your data just happens to be a weird uh, a weird thing, okay? So, you know, um, you guys remember the talk about the confidence intervals, and uh, you know we see the dog, and and we're trying to guess the location of the invisible owner. Well, in those cases, we say you know I'm 95% confident that the owner is within two yards of the dog. Now, the owner could be three yards away from the dog. Okay, we didn't do anything wrong. We followed the process correctly, and we said, and according to the information we have, we conclude that the we're confident that the owners be within two yards of the dog. But, you know, if the owner happened to be three yards away from the dog, then what means is that the data that we had, this picture, it was taken at a weird time where the dog happened to be more than two yards away from the owner, which doesn't happen often, but it could happen. Okay. 
All right. So what we have is that the probability of committing a type 1 error, okay, this is equal to alpha. Because our significance level, alpha, you know, if, if we ever get a p-value less than alpha, that's when we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so if alpha is 5%, we say if my p-value is less than 5%, I'm going to conclude that it didn't happen by random chance, but that my null hypothesis is wrong. Okay. However, if alpha is 5%, and I happen to get a p-value of 4%, Okay, so if alpha is 5% and I happen to get a p-value of 4%, well, I would reject the null hypothesis. But it's also possible that the data I got was from <coughs> random chance, and there's a 4% probability of getting the data from random, random chance. Okay, so in that case, we have, uh, you know, the null hypothesis could be true, and we could be making a, a mistake here. Okay. So when we choose the decision criteria to be alpha, we are basically saying, I am willing to make a type 1 error 5% of the time, or type 1 error alpha of the time. Okay. So our choice of alpha reflects our willingness to make a type 1 error. Okay, So you might say, well, I don't want to make type 1 error. I should just pick a small alpha. Okay. Well, on the other hand, if we choose to decrease alpha, okay, choosing to decrease alpha means that we're going to be rejecting the null hypothesis less often. Okay, So that means if we're rejecting the null hypothesis less often, if we're choosing not to reject the null hypothesis very much, um, then we're going to make that mistake more often. So choosing to decrease alpha means we increase the probability of a type 2 error. So you can't do one without doing the other, okay? If, by changing alpha. If you gather more data, then then you're in better shape. But if you're not going to gather more data, this is this is what we have, okay? So the probability of a type two error, we uh, we say is equal to beta, okay? Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet type 1 error. Beta is the second letter of the Greek alphabet, type 2 error. Okay? So alpha, it kind of looks like an A. This is, I don't know, our Latin alphabet kind of derives a bit from the Greek alphabet. And so we have A and B, and actually alphabet comes from alpha, beta. We care about this stuff. But <laughs> so we, got, um, we have A, you know, the first letter, B, the second letter, kind of like that. All right, so choosing to decrease alpha means we increase the probability of type 2 error. Okay, so here's a, here's a question. Um, if type 1 error, well, okay, eh, let's, let's go back. So let me just describe two scenarios here. All right, so let's say we have a criminal case criminal case, all right? And we say if a defendant's put on trial, what uh, what do they say? The defendant is presumed presumed innocent until proven guilty, right? This is this is how our justice system is set up. Uh-huh. It's not it's not supposed to be set up that way. It's supposed to be set up that way, right? Um, so this is 
this is how it's supposed to be set up, okay? And, you know, there's always debates on whether, you know, I, th I think this is the right way. <laughs> this is the American way. <laughs> um, so, you know, the null hypothesis is the defendant is innocent. And then the alternative is the defendant is guilty. Okay. All right, and then you know uh, evidence is presented, and we make a conclusion. Or I say the jury makes a conclusion. Okay. So, in the ideal case, the I um, ideal scenarios. Okay, is if um, the defendant is guilty. the jury concludes guilty. Okay, so that's the ideal case. And so that means uh, when the null is false, uh, they reject the null. So that's uh, one ideal scenario. And the other ideal scenario is if the defendant is innocent, the jury concludes not guilty. Okay, so that is when the null is true, do not reject the null. Okay, so these are the ideal scenarios. Okay, but we do not live in a perfect world so we are bound to make errors. OK. What would a type 1 error be? Type 1 error is mistakenly rejecting the null. And a type 2 error is mistakenly not rejecting the null. So type 1 error would be So what's a type 1 error? Guilty but innocent? Or, or guilty but jury says innocent? Or not guilty? <laughs> <laughs> so type 1 error is the null hypothesis is true. So meaning the defendant is innocent, but we choose to reject it. We have re we're mistakenly rejecting the null. So so the jury concludes guilty, OK? So this means defendant is innocent, but jury convicts, OK? What's a type 2 error? When it's false and you can't reject it. OK, so, so what does that mean in the case of our criminal case? The defendant is guilty. It's interesting that you said he, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the defendant is guilty, but the jury concludes not guilty, or the jury um, chooses to acquit. OK? And uh, you know, I think uh, in a lot of high-profile cases, you know, we see type 2 errors being made, or what we feel to be type 2 errors. We don't, we don't actually know the. Um, we don't know the truth because we don't have all of the ev uh, all of the knowledge. Okay, but you know sometimes we feel like type two errors have been made. Okay, but if we you know we were going to set up our justice system, what er which type of error is worse? The first, right? I think um, you know we have. I think it's it's worse. 
to convict an innocent person, you know, you know, especially if you think of uh, having having like the death penalty or things like that, it would be it would be very bad um, if if an innocent person is uh, is convicted or condemned. Where uh, you know we don't we don't want either of these errors. We we don't want either of these. But if we had to choose one over the other, I think we would say the type one error is worse than the type two error. Okay, and people might disagree on this point, but this is how our our uh, our system is set up. Okay, so do we want to choose a large alpha or do we want to choose a small alpha? Okay, yes, so because type 1 error is worse, than type 2 error, okay, we choose a small alpha, okay, and, uh, and they say this in court, they don't say choose, use a small alpha, but they say, um, you know, what, it, what do they charge the jury um, with? before they deliberate. Yeah, yeah that, that, that you have to be convinced, be, to be sure beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? Um, and so, so they don't want you to, they don't want the jury to say, ah, I feel like he's guilty, so, or I feel like she's guilty because, and so I'm gonna conclude guilty, okay? They don't want it to be on a hunch, they want it to be beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? And so because, because of that, we're bound to make type 2 error more often, okay? Because the, the, you know, the burden falls on the prosecution to, uh, to convince the jury beyond a reasonable doubt, um, it, it's hard, okay? Type 2 error is, uh, is, is going to happen more often. Uh, so, you know, and, and I think... I don't know if you guys listened to the serial podcast season one. Okay, I think it was it was a very compelling story because there's kind of this question of you know was a type one error? Did we make that mistake? Okay. And, well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> but um, you know we don't we don't know uh, we don't know all of the stories, right? Oh, I mean, so uh, I think at the at the end of the at the of season one you get the sense that um, it wasn't beyond a reasonable doubt, right? That there, there was a reasonable doubt, you know, we're not convinced either of, you know, whether he is guilty or innocent, but uh, it seems they, they might have convicted beyond, um, without being sure uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. So that's, that's a scenario where we have a type one error worse than a type two error. There are other situations where type two error is worse than type one error, um, and in that cases, in those cases, you would want a large alpha. Okay, so if type two error, on the other hand, if type two error is worse than type one error, we would choose. A large alpha, okay. So if if not rejecting the null has uh, has dire consequences, then you want to uh, you want a large alpha, okay. So you know things like uh, cancer screening, okay, or you know even. STD testing or whatever it might be, okay? If, uh, you know, when, when people, uh, you know, kind of the first pass, like, uh, so if, if we're trying to detect cancers in people, um, the, uh, the, the initial screening uh, should be very kind of like, uh, quote, sensitive, okay? So, um, so, you know, if, if you're a woman, you're supposed to do a monthly breast exam, 
and it's like, you know, you check for lumps or something, okay? Now, you could end up ha feeling a lump in your breast for one of many reasons, okay? Um, and But this is a very uh, kind of a broad thing that says, hey, if anything is possibly wrong, go see a doctor, okay? Because, um, because not detecting cancer is far worse than having a, a false positive, okay? So if you, you know, if you feel a lump, you go to the doctor, then the doctor does more thorough exams and things like that where um, they, can, uh, they can be more certain of whether it is cancerous or not, okay? Biopsies, uh, you know, are a little bit more specific in um, determining whether cancer exists or not. And, uh, and so, so that, that exists, okay? But um, so in that case, you know, thinking that you are cancer-free when you in, in fact have cancer is a much worse scenario than thinking you might have cancer when you're cancer-free, okay? So, so in that case, you would choose a large alpha, and that's why they say, you know, do a monthly breast exam where if you feel anything strange, go see a doctor. Because, and so that's like, anything could be possibly wrong, you know? Uh, it's probably also why WebMD says cancer for every single, <laughs> um, every single thing because you know they just want, you know, if you're going to WebMD for to check if something's wrong, they don't want to, they don't want people to uh, think that they're healthy, just for the slight possible case that something could be wrong. Okay. Yes. Choose a large alpha. Yeah, we have choice over alpha, okay? We don't really have choice over beta, okay? So if type 2 error is worse than type 1 error, we would choose a large alpha. That's, um, yeah, um, beta is a result of the truth and the alternative, and, um, and we don't actually have a whole lot of control over that. But as researchers, we do get to choose uh, our choice of alpha. All right. Um, so we've, we've gone through uh, some math. I have to go back and I have to talk about non-directional alternatives, OK? OK, and so this is when uh, HA, the alternative hypothesis, has a not equal to sign, OK? Or the questions say, you know, do we have evidence that uh, the means are different, okay? Or, you know, have changed, not the same, things like that, okay? We are not specifying that one group is bigger than group two. Group one is bigger than group two or something like that, okay? And the other one, we said the alternative was we suspect that the uh, mean salary for women is less than the mean salary for men. So we were specifying a direction in which we were expecting um, our, our data to appear. Uh, for non-directional alternatives, we've got a not equal sign, and we're saying things like, are they different? Are they, you know, have they changed? Something like that. Okay. So, so for here. Um, you know, your test statistic is still going to be, for the t-test, is going to be y bar 1 minus y bar 2 divided by your standard error. Your standard error is the same formula that we had before. Standard error is still s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2, OK? The process is. Uh, you know, to get your p-value now, okay, so we look up the test statistic, in the t-table, okay, and what we do is uh, we say our tail area you know, is between the corresponding column headings. Okay. 
And the key difference here is that the tail area is not the p-value. So for a directional alternative, or for non-directional alternatives, Our p-value is double the tail area. So, so example, if, uh, if the tail is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.02, okay, then the p-value is between, you know, 0 0.02 is less than our p-value, less than 0 0.04. Okay, so we double whatever our tail is. We double that to say our um, to get our p-value. And then now that we have this p-value, we make our conclusion. Okay, so our p-value in this case is still less than 5%, so we're in good shape, okay? But we would still reject the null hypothesis. You know, unless your p-value was 2%, then you would not reject the null. Or I'm sorry, if, unless your alpha was 2% or something, okay? Is this okay? So when you have a non-directional alternative, uh, and the reason for this, okay, is that, um, you know, in our previous example with the salaries, we said, you know, what's the probability that we end up getting, you know, two samples where the difference was $2,500, okay? So with the directional alternative, we were specifically asking, what's the probability that we get um, female salaries being 2500 less than the male salaries? When it's non-directional, there are two possibilities. We want to know what's the po probability that group one has 2,500 less than group two, but also what's the possibility that group one has 2,500 or more than group two, okay? And so that takes into account both sides, both possibilities, because in here, in this case, when we say are they different, um, a positive difference or a negative difference are both of interest to us. Whereas, um, you know, when it's directional, we were only interested in one of those differences. Okay. So let's, uh, I'll give you guys an example problem to work through, and, uh, and you can see, test if this, uh, if this makes sense. Okay. So I don't know. It do... Um, this is silly. Okay. Do Tigons way different from ligers? What's a Tigon and a liger? Huh? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so Tigon, so these are both lion-tiger crosses, okay? So I believe a Tigon is um, father-tiger, mother-lion. Yeah, they can, okay? Um, and a liger is father-lion. These are real. Oh my god, it's real. And mother-tiger. Huh? Yeah, the the the, the, there's the ligers and the tigons themselves are sterile. No, actually, I'm sorry. There was a case where the tigon gave birth to uh, more children. Um, but anyway, the, you so can't. What did it mean? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> they're they're hybrid animals. Okay. So do tigons weigh different from ligers? Okay. Well, now I'm expanding your, your mind. You go ahead and look it up on Wikipedia. Tigers and... Yeah, yeah, they're... Okay. All right, so sample one will be uh, the Tigons. Sample two will be the Ligers. Now, 
Uh, I guess in reality, there are just not that many Tigons and Ligers that exist. <laughs> They've almost all been bred in captivity because they just live in different parts of the world. You don't. So, is it crazy? Well, the, the laggers are, okay? All right, so we're going um, to pretend like we have data on this. So let's say we've managed to obtain 10 random laggers, which I don't even think 10 laggers exist in the world. But, uh, and I'm completely making up numbers here, okay? I have no idea. Um, so the answer is they are different, okay? And the reason why, okay, so Tigons don't get big. Ligers get huge, okay? Because for tigers, there's a growth inhibiting gene in the tig uh, father, male tiger, and in lions, the growth inhibiting gene is in the mother, female lion, okay? So when uh, male lion and female tiger mate, um, unnaturally, uh, they, there's no growth inhibiting gene in the liger, so they just grow to be huge. Uh, the tigons, on the other hand, they, they stay small. Okay, so, I mean, they're still, they're big. Uh, let's, uh, but let's, I'm gonna just pretend like these are the numbers. <laughs> so how big do they get, the small ones? I don't know. I'm making these numbers up, okay? So don't, don't hold me to this. OK, so now I'm going to say conduct a t-test. Uh, with uh, alpha equal to 5%. OK, and so the question here is, do tigons weigh different, I guess, on average? On average. Do tigons have a different weight from laggers? Okay, I'm going to pause the video and let you guys work. Okay, I know some of you guys are still working, but uh, let's we'll go over the answer here. Um, all right, so our test statistic is going to be y bar minus y, I'm sorry, y1 bar minus y2 bar over the standard error. And our standard error is the square root of 105 squared over 10 plus 120 squared over 10. I punch this into my calculator. So 105 squared over 10 plus 120 squared over 10. Take the square root of this number, and I get 50.5. 4, 2, 3, so I'll put that there. You can do 605 minus 960 divided by this quantity, and I get negative 7.04. Okay, we're going to have degrees of freedom equal to n1 plus n2 minus 2, so I have 18 degrees of freedom. I'm going to look up the value 7.04. Okay, so we just ignore the negative. We go up here. So 18 degrees of freedom. We're looking for 7.04. Okay, the n number, the biggest number in this table is 3.922. Okay, so I'll go ahead and copy this. So at 3.922, all I can say is that 7.04 is more extreme. So if I had to put something, 7.04 is uh, goes beyond here, OK? So if I look at the column heading, that's 0 0.0005, OK? So this corresponds to a tail of 0.0005. Yeah, question. Were we supposed to do our null hypothesis before we started? Oh, I, I, yes, we should have. Um, sorry. OK, our null hypothesis would be mu of the Tigons is same as the mean of the ligers, and the alternative mu of the tigons is different from mu of the ligers. 
Okay. All right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. So, there here these are our uh, hypotheses. Okay. Um, it says the corresponding tail area for 3.922 is 0 0.0005. So what this means is you know my value is all the way out at 7.04 so is the area in my tail going to be more or less than 0 0.0005 less than right so so my tail area is less than 0 0.0005 right so you know if we think about our picture at uh, 3.922 I have um, 0 0.0005, okay? And, and here I'm drawing a line out at 7. So how much is going to be in here? Even less than 0 0.0005. Okay. Because it's a non-directional test, all right? So the not equal sign means non-directional. What do I do to my tail area to get my p-value? I double it. So my P value, whatever it is, I know that it's going to be less than 0 0.001. Okay? I don't know exactly what it is, but I do know that it's less than 0 0.001. Okay? So with a P value this small, what do I do? I reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that Tigons and that the mean weight is different. Mean weights are different. Okay? And if anything, our data supports the idea that Tigons weigh less than Ligers. Okay? So our data says that Tigons weigh less than Tigers, Ligers. Tigons weigh less than ligers. The uh, we reject the null hypothesis, right? Okay. Question. So if our t statistic is ever like completely off our t chart, yeah, end, yeah, pick the most extreme one and then yeah, off of that. yeah. So if the t, if your test statistic is bigger than the rightmost value, then that means your tail area is less than the rightmost value. So it's going to be less than 0 0.0005. If your test statistic is smaller than the leftmost value, okay, then that means your resulting tail area is going to be greater than whatever the leftmost value is, I think 20% or something like that. Okay, Because that means your the test statistic is even closer to zero, even closer to kind of the, the center than, uh, than what the table shows. Okay. Mean weights are different, yeah. We conclude that the mean weights are different. That's what I wrote here. Okay. Is this okay? All right. Um, we are going to touch one little section in Chapter 8. So Chapter 8 is all about paired data. And for now, I'm skipping Chapter 7, Section 10. I'll cover that next week, OK? Chapter 7, Section 10, I'll cover that next week. Uh, chapter 8, Paired Data. Here, um, so in our previous examples, we assumed that our two samples were independent. So in Chapter 7, you know, we were dealing with ligers and tigons. Our selection of the liger specimens were different, were, were independent of the selection of tigons, OK? We have two samples, our selection of women to observe their salaries and our selection of men to observe their salaries. Those selections were made independently, OK? Um, in chapter 8, the samples in the specimens in sample 1 are linked to the specimens in sample two, okay? Uh, the observations in sample one 
are linked to the observations in sample two. Okay. Um, so common scenarios are before and afters. Okay. If we take measurements before something and measurements after something. then the each before measurement is linked to an after measurement, right? It's not like we took these measurements before and then we just got completely different people and measured the afters, okay? We're looking at the same people before, the same people after, so each observation over here is linked to an observation over here in our, in our two samples, okay? Uh, you know, in other studies, you know, maybe uh, we matched pairs studies, you know, we're, we're matching pairs together, or we do twin studies. Those are also, um, you have paired data, okay? So, there are twin studies, etc. We don't really do, I mean, it's hard to find, conduct twin studies all that often, but, okay. So here's a here's a silly uh, silly example. Okay, what are matched pairs. Matched pairs um, you know, we get volunteers to uh, to participate in our study, and we match. You know, uh, when we split them up into treatment groups, we try to match people together, and we say, hey, uh, based on your these certain characteristics, you are very similar to this other person. You know. Both of you exercise this amount, a much amount. You know, you'd probably fill out a survey to participate, and then they try to match you with someone who is very similar to you in the other group. And then, you know, when they do the experiment, one of you gets the treatment, and the other gets the placebo. And then they're trying to see, you know, does a difference develop between these two people who've been matched for similarity? Okay, so that's a matched pair study. Something like that, okay? It's kind of hard to pull off because everyone's different, right? There's so many, yeah. So you have to, you're trying to match people. You, you can't say, like, okay, we're going to match people based on eye color and hair color and, you know, how many teeth they have and stuff like that, you know? You're going to, you try to figure out characteristics that are relevant to the study. So if you're trying to match, like, if the study's on, does something work on blood pressure? You'd probably try to match on diet, try to match on uh, whatever, you know. So you'll, relevant questions will be like, are you vegetarian and are you, do you exercise and do you have a history of high blood pressure in your family? You know, they, they try to match you on stuff like that, that are relevant, that shouldn't, or, and, and, you know, race is always kind of this mysterious thing that we don't fully understand, so they probably try to match you with someone of a similar race, but they're not going to say like, Oh, your eye colors are different, so you can't be matched or something like that. Who knows? Okay. Okay, so here's a silly example. Let's say there's, a, you know, a, a weight loss pill is being marketed, okay? All right, and so, you know, the weight loss pill is expensive. We only had four people participate in our study, okay? So we have before weight and the after weight. All right. Okay, so let's say we had someone weigh 180 before and afterwards they weigh 175, 260, and afterwards they weigh 255, um, 290, and 285, and 200, and 196. Okay, so what is, you know, what are the means? All right, so what do I have? 180 plus 260 plus 290 plus 200 divided by 4. My average here is 232.5. Okay, 175 plus 255 plus 285 plus 196 divided by 4. 
227.75. Okay. Um, all right, based on our means, does it seem like the weight loss pill is effective? If we look at the standard deviations, uh, I'm going to just do this very quickly in R because I don't feel like computing this myself. Uh, okay. 180, 260, 290, 200. Oops. So I got a standard deviation of 51.23. And then over here, One point oh two or oh three. Okay, well, I'll tell you, uh, and I'm going to skip the work. If we did a hypothesis test as um, and treated these as if they were um, independent samples, okay, did a t test for independent samples. Uh, it would conclude not to reject the null hypothesis. You can check for yourself, but uh, okay. And what's what what's going on is that the initial differences in starting weights has so much difference has uh, has such a w huge spread that. Um, any effect of this weight loss pill, which is, uh, which exists but is not very big, and gets drowned out by the the variation from individual to individual. Okay, so you know we see a difference of about you know five pounds, four point seven five pounds between this group and this group, but that difference gets lost because the initial starting weights were so vastly different. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to create a difference column. Okay, so the difference column we do before minus after. So this person uh, lost five pounds, this person lost five pounds, this person lost five pounds, and this person lost four pounds. Okay, and in this case, then it does seem like indeed the weight loss pill does work okay it's maybe it's not a drastic amount but um, it certainly it seems to be consistent in its uh, in its results okay So the standard deviation of this group is 0.5. Okay. So when we do a t-test for paired data, okay, okay, we look at only the difference column. So we have to calculate the difference column. If we have a before and after situation, we have to calculate the difference column. And we look only at that column. So once this difference column has been calculated, we just look at this. We don't look at the before and after. OK, it's just, just this, this data only, OK? All right, so um, what? 
uh, and there's also another difference. Our hypotheses, our null hypothesis, is not mu1 minus mu2 or mu before minus mu after. It's the mean difference, mu of the difference. Is that difference 0? Or is the mean difference different from 0, or greater than 0, or less than 0? Okay. Uh, in our case, we'd probably want a directional alternative, so we'll do uh, greater than zero. Okay, uh, but I'll write or the alternative is mean difference not equal to zero, or that the mean difference is less than zero. Okay, depending depending on your scenario. Okay, but so here the hypotheses are different. It's not um, it's not mu one minus mu two or mu one equal to mu two. It's that the means are different. The I mean the difference column is that mean zero or something other than zero. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy our difference column because this is the only one that matters now. And we'll go to our, oops, our, our next slide. Okay, so this is the only column that matters. And so here, our test statistic is going to be d bar, the average difference, divided by our standard error. Okay, and the standard error is the standard deviation of our difference column divided by the square root of n. Okay, so in our case, our standard error is 0 0.5 divided by the square root of 4. So this ends up being 0.25. So we have d bar equal to 4.75 divided by 0.25. we end up getting this very large value, a test statistic of 19. So we're 19 standard errors away from zero, okay? which is huge, which is huge. Okay, so you know, if we look this up, And T table with how many degrees of freedom will we have now? N minus one, right? Okay. So, uh, I, does this look familiar as S over the square root of N? That should look familiar because it's coming from confidence intervals when we had just one sample. You guys remember that? Y bar plus or minus. The confidence interval, s over the square root of n, so it's it's related to that. Um, so it's different here. So we have this, and what we get is uh, the tail area is going to be less than 0 0.0005. Okay, just because you know three, the largest it goes out is. Uh, 12.924, but we're 19 away, okay? So 12.9 is, is quite large when you only have three standard, three degrees of freedom, but we're 19 out. So our tail area is less than 0 0.0005. So our p-value is less than 0 0.0005. This leads us to reject the null hypothesis. And we conclude that we have evidence that the average difference between before and after
is uh, greater than zero. Okay, so in other words, the magic pill, the pill helps you, helps lose weight. The weight loss pill helps lose weight. Okay. Maybe not maybe not drastic, but it is a significant amount. Okay? Statistically significant. It's a non-zero amount, I should say. Right. Are we feeling okay with this? Alright, I got I got one last <laughs> One last part. Yes. So yes. We did a T test for independent uh -huh. samples. We can reject the thing or we can't? Well, okay. So, so, well, that's doing it the wrong way. I'll tell you that. Okay. Right. And what would happen is if you did it that way, you would come to the wrong conclusion that you should not reject the null hypothesis. You come to the conclusion, uh, your test statistic would end up being like 0.02 or I don't know, something very small. Your p-value would be greater than 20%, and you'd come to the conclusion, do not reject the null hypothesis, okay, if you did it that way. But that's not the right way to do it, because um, the, the before, each before measurement is linked to an after measurement. Is that okay? All right, so we'll, um, okay. All right, so let me um, rewind a little bit, okay, and talk about confidence intervals, okay? So when we did confidence intervals for um, mu1 minus mu2, okay, we were able to make conclusions Uh, like we have evidence that the sample means are different. I'm mean, not the sample means that the uh, means of the populations are different. You guys remember this? Okay. These are the same types of conclusions that we make at the end of a t test. Okay. And in fact, the confidence interval and the t-test are very closely related, okay? So in fact, um, conducting a confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 at, you know, the 95% confidence level is equivalent to a uh, non-directional, so it's important that it is non-directional, t-test um, for independent samples using alpha equal to 0.05. And, and likewise, you know, a 90% confidence level is equivalent to doing a non-directional t-test for independent samples with alpha equal to 10%, okay? So 90% CI goes with t 
t-test with alpha equal to 0.1 and you know 99% confidence interval goes with a t-test with alpha equal to 0.01 okay again this, these are all non-directional t-tests with it for independent samples okay so it, it no longer works when you're talking about directional t-tests and stuff like that okay so what does this mean all right well let's see um, Okay, so let's uh, let's try something out. Okay, so let's say uh, you do a hypothesis test Okay uh, You use Alpha equal to 0 0.05, okay your conclusion is not to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so you've done a hypothesis test for the, uh, the means of two populations. Alpha was 0.05. You choose not to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. What does this tell us about our p-value? Huh? Yeah, I mean, do we have any idea what our p-value is? Like, I've given you no other information about this thing. I gave, told you nothing about the data. I told you nothing about anything else. Can we say anything about the p-value? That it's greater than 0.05. Okay, so you know we can you know so we can say our p-value must have been greater than 0.05. Okay, so let me. Here's a question. If uh, if we did if we use the same data. and redid the test okay this time alpha is equal to 0 0.01 what would happen what conclusion would we make So what, what conclusion would we make this time, I guess, is the question. So we, we're using the same data and we're redoing the test. But this time, alpha is 0 0.01. What would we, conclusion would we make this time? Yeah, so we would say, do not reject. The null hypothesis. Does that make sense? Okay, because from before we know, you know, um, um, you know, we don't know anything about our stuff. But when we redo the test, is our p-value going to change? No, everything else stays the same, right? Everything, the data is the same. So the test statistics the same. The standard error is the same. The tests, everything we look up. It's going to be the same. Our p-value is going to be the same. Okay. So here, you know, we still know we still know that our p-value is greater than 0 0.05. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay. All right. What if uh, same question, but this time alpha is 10 percent. Okay, what conclusion do we make? Well, I, 
that's my question to you. Yeah, this time we don't know, OK? Uh, we cannot answer. OK, because we do not know if p, the p-value is bigger than 10% or less than 10%, OK? Do we see the error type or no? Uh, you know, we can't say anything about the error type until we make a conclusion, OK? Because um, Okay. Um, is this okay? All right. Um, same data. We're going to make a 95% confidence interval. What can we say about this confidence interval? Here, well, I'll, I'll just answer this question for you. OK. <laughs> so this time, we know that a 95% confidence interval is equivalent to doing a t-test at f level 5%, right? So whatever conclusion I would make at a t-test at level 5% is the same conclusion I would make with a confidence interval at 95%. OK? So my t-test was not to reject not to reject the null hypothesis. So I would say I do not have evidence that there is a difference between the means. Okay? So this means our confidence interval would lead us to the same conclusion. Okay? Our confidence interval would also lead us to conclude uh, no evidence of a difference. Okay, just like the t-test. Okay, so you know we've concluded not to reject uh, the null up here, so our confidence interval would lead us to the same conclusion. Okay, what is true about a confidence interval that leads you to say no evidence of a difference? So, so if, if a confidence interval has led you to the conclusion that, that there's no difference between the means, or I mean that we don't have evidence of a difference between the means, what, is, what does that mean? That zero is a plausible value for the difference, right? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, that zero is within our confidence interval. So what would, can we say about the confidence interval? So we know that our confidence interval contains 0 as a plausible value for the difference. Does that make sense? OK. So that's the 95% confidence interval. If the 95% confidence interval contains 0, will the 90% confidence contain, can, in, interval contain 0? OK, so think of it. What's the relationship between a 90% confidence interval and a 95% confidence interval? Same data. So if this is the 95% confidence interval, the 90% confidence interval is just wider, right? So if this contains 0, will this contain 0? Yes. Yes. So the 90% confidence interval will contain 0, OK? On the other hand, if 95% contains 0 and I shrink it, will the shrinking interval contain 0? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know, OK? So. 
So a 90% confidence interval will still contain zero. A 99% confidence interval may or may not contain zero. No, I'm sorry. I, I got that wrong. I got that wrong. I, blah. Everything I said was just backwards. I'm sorry. 90% <laughs> confidence interval is more narrow than the 95%. I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm not thinking. Okay, sorry. So the 95% confidence interval is this. The 90% confidence interval is more narrow. I apologize. I apologize. Okay? So if this contains zero and I shrink it down to 90%, it may or may not contain zero. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay? And if this contains zero, 95% contains zero, and I go to 99% and I make it wider, then that will definitely still contain zero. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, let me write that down just so. <laughs> um, uh, just so I don't have further confuse you, right? So the 95% CI contains zero. OK. 99% CI is wider than 95% CI. So it will definitely contain zero also. Okay. On the other hand, the 90% CI is narrower. and the 95% confidence interval. So it may or may not contain zero. <sighs> OK. Feel okay about this? All right. So you might see some questions like this on uh, on next week's quiz. And so next week's quiz will cover t-test for independent samples, t-test for paired samples, and then some of this confidence interval and t-test relation stuff. Yes. Uh, will there be any like, R commands on the quiz? No, no, no R commands on the quiz. Okay. Have a good week, you guys. We'll. Uh, See you next Thursday.